Welcome to Mormon Land, where we explore news in and about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm senior religion reporter Peggy Fletcher Stack. Joining me is senior managing editor David Noyce, who, is, who oversees our faith coverage. Hi, Dave. Hello, Peggy. Before we start, we remind you about another way to support Mormon Land. Just go to patreon.com, where with a donation as small as $3 a month, you can access transcripts to our podcasts, our complete newsletter, and all of our religion coverage. Again, that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Mormon Land. Now for today's episode. The role of women in any patriarchal faith is always fraught. It is especially confusing in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which celebrated women who led the charge for suffrage while also practicing polygamy. Latter-day Saint women like Eliza Snow and Emmeline Wells held high-profile positions in the hierarchy almost until their deaths, a kind of mirror image of the faith's male apostles, while today's top female leaders are in and out in just five years. Past general presidents of the Women's Relief Society were well known to members and wielded wide personal power, but like today's high-level female leaders, they never held offices as, quote, general authorities. Now comes word that, unlike in the past, today's General Relief Society presidencies don't even meet weekly with an apostle liaison to the governing first presidency. Here to talk about these issues is April Young Bennett, a blogger and essayist for Exponent 2 who has seen the evolving changes for Latter-day Saint women up close. April, welcome. Thank you. So did you know that the General Relief Society president no longer meets separately with an apostle? I did not know that until you mentioned it to me. And so... Oh, what did you think they they met with the first presidency? I assumed so. Yes, <laughs> I made the same assumption. So yes, I mm-hmm. think a lot of LDS women did think that until they were told otherwise. So, what do you think about the fact that they don't? I wish I were more shocked. But every time I hear that Mormon women lack some kind of a power or some kind of an access. It's not such a shock because we hear them lacking power and access a lot. So (laughs) it's just another example. So how do you view this role in a place in the hierarchy? Clearly not the first presidency, which is all men, not the apostles, all men. But these executive councils are right under that. And they are made up of a couple of apostles, a number of men and, and a couple of women. Well, I think it's absolutely vital that women be on these councils. This is something that I advocated for before it happened. And I still really believe that it's important because if you have a council, as we used to not very long ago, I think this change was made in 2015. It was. Mm -hmm. If you have a chain, if you have a council that's completely composed of men, they are interested in women's opinion and they might call them in for feedback. But that's really not a great way for women to participate because women are not involved in the brainstorming process that happens at the beginning. So their ideas might not even be considered and they're not involved in the decision making process that happens in the end. And so women need to be there at the table the entire time. So it's important they be at this on these councils. That said, there's really no reason why this should be instead of meeting with the presidency. (laughs) Obviously, a good manager does both, right? They have their team meetings where they meet with the whole team. They also meet with their employees individually. So, April, what improvements have you seen for Latter-day Saint women in recent years, and maybe especially during President Russell Nelson's tenure? An important one was that there have been changes to the temple ceremonies that make them more, well, kinder and gentler towards women than they Mm -hmm. used to be, which is very important. Um, The the addition of allowing women to witness baptisms and witness weddings is so important. Um, Before that, women had no official role at these very important times in our lives. And so that's a big deal also. Um, Another that I think people don't talk about very much, but I consider to be extremely important, is that we now have our policy published publicly. Um, For a long time, the Church Handbook of Instructions was limited to essentially only church leaders, which was defined as tens of thousands of men and nine women. And so Mm -hmm. (laughs) women did not have a lot of access to that book, which basically 
lays out all of the policies of church and how they affect women. And so how can you affect policy if you're not even allowed to read it? Now it's all online. Anyone can read it. Uh, absolutely. Member or and it not is so boring. Yes. It's extremely <laughs> boring, but I encourage people to look into it anyway, because yeah. it's important. Yeah. So, Oh, okay. So a big sticking point continues to be the shortage of women who speak at general conference. It's the highest profile platform in the faith for addressing the whole membership and frankly, the world. What would you suggest to remedy that? I mean, this past conference, three women spoke as opposed to 29 men. Yeah. First of all, there's no doctrinal reason why we have to limit conference talks to these nine women. Um, that is a tradition that has gone on for ages. There's nothing in the scriptures that says these are the only women that are eligible to talk in conference. And actually, we have examples from the past where women who did not fit into those nine callings were invited to speak. So it's not necessary to limit it to that. That said, I would love to see a broader solution where there are simply more women in leadership at all. Um, part of the reason why they are so outnumbered, not only in general conference, but also in the councils of the church, is because we have created an artificial kind of a boundary around which women are allowed to participate. We limited it to nine. That's not true for men. <laughs> there are many, many men who serve as general authorities in the church, and there should be many women. I think it's a great thing that we now have 70s more involved because now that we have such a broader group of men who, who have this authority within the church, we can see more demographic perspectives, people from different countries, different races, different ethnicities. We should have that for women also. We should have an equal number of women who are in these advanced callings in the church, participating in councils, giving talks in general conference. So let's go back to 2015 when women were added to the executive councils in the wake of the ordained women movement and, and you were involved with ordained women. What, what did that mean to you? I was thrilled. I thought that was in a very important step. Um, like I said, I think that it's absolutely vital that women are at the table the entire time. Now, there were some extreme limitations to what was offered. Um, they, they, I think they announced that time they were going to put one woman on each of three councils. Yeah. Um, outnumbered by how many men? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and so that's not an extreme voice. I mean, it's an important symbolic gesture, right? Because we're saying that these decisions are not just for men, that women are involved. However, having just one woman involved is not the best way to do it. Really, there should be several women on each of these councils. So I was pleased to see them there and for the symbolism of what that meant, that these decisions aren't just for men. But obviously, we needed more women. And three councils certainly didn't go far enough. I mean, some very important councils still exclude women, like the Correlation Committee. And that's had a Actually, big Actually, there are women on are there. Are there on there now? Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That's at the time at 2015, there weren't. That's right. No, there that's weren't. Right. At yeah. the time, there weren't. That's yeah. right. These are, I guess there are, count. there's a difference, I am told, between councils and committees. Mm -hmm. And there are this, these three main councils. And now more than one woman is on them. And then there's the committees, two other committees. One is communication. One is correlation. Both of them now have women. Terrific. I'm on so them. glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. But did, back then, did you think that, that they were finally going to be at the table? Well, I knew they would be present and that's a, yeah. a step up. I mean, it's good that they're there. Like I said, it's a good symbolic gesture. The way they've set it up they don't have a lot of power on these councils. I mean, they're outranked by every other person sitting there because they don't hold priesthood office. They're not considered a general authority like all of the men in the room. Um, and so what are they if they don't have authority? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, so so there's extreme limitations on what they can do there. There's research that so, shows that when women are surrounded by a large group of men and they're highly in the minority, that they speak less that this is a, something that just quiets them down. So that's a big problem. You know, it's, it's better than nothing. <laughs> I mean, we, we had a podcast with the BYU researchers who, mm -hmm. who, about that, about the dynamic it, it, beyond the church, just right. any kind of meeting where, you know, man might have, uh, there's more men, first of all, or if the men are the deciders, how it changes the dynamic. It's interesting. I urge uh, listeners to maybe go back and listen to that one. Um, several years ago, the church, uh, they added like advisor mentors of women in, I think it started in Europe. There were like mm -hmm. nine and it was expanded. And there's, I, I'll peg your story. So there's already 60 plus. No, 93. 90, 90 93, plus. Yeah. yeah. So I just inverted the six and the nine. So um, it, and they're everywhere except the United States. Now, were you aware of this? And what do you think of that? I was aware of this. And 
on the one hand, I'm always pleased whenever a new role for women is it, it comes to existence. And there's another way they're seeking feedback from women. That said, um, all women, including those nine we've been talking about before in our church, are really more like consultants than leaders. Mm. And that's a big deal because it's not that we don't value consultants. We do. I mean, when in a business, you bring in consultants because you think they're experts, because you want their feedback. It's very useful to you. That said, a consultant is not really part of the organization. They can't advance within the organization. They can't supervise or hire or choose who their employees are. And even though they give important recommendations and feedback, they don't make the decisions. They don't own the business. They're outsiders. And it's concerning when you see the church as a place where women are outsiders within our own church, where we consult, but we don't lead. Mm -hmm. I've I've noticed as uh, the church uh, releases information about their humanitarian donations and their efforts around it. It seems that generally Saudi presidency is much more involved in leading out those on these humanitarian efforts. And while this raises the, those women's profile on the world stage, it doesn't necessarily raise it within the membership and the church. You don't hear people talk about that much among the membership. What are your thoughts on this? Well, we don't know who they are. I mean, they don't speak. They're not invited to speak in general conference. Going back to that again, mm-hmm. we don't, they, they're not talking to us. They don't supervise us. For that matter, no women supervise us. Uh, if you look at the structure of the church, um, Women aren't in the hierarchy. A local Relief Society president reports to her male bishop and he reports to his male stake president and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, The women of our general auxiliary leaders, no one really reports to them. They're not part of the hierarchy. Um, Even though there are stake Relief Society leaders and ward Relief Society leaders, they don't report up up a hierarchy towards women. Hmm. They're all reporting to men. So what does that mean when we have a bunch of women who are working and doing excellent work, doing a lot of work, but they're all accountable only to men and never to women? Well, that sets them up better to be, well, essentially spokespeople for the brethren as opposed to advocates for women. I mean, yet there's an elaborate reporting chain for on the male side. Um, I mean, the church several weeks ago just released their area presidencies around the world right. and, and they're part of this reporting chain. A lot of men, obviously only men, as a matter of fact. How could the church maybe replicate that with women? Well, so. I know. Okay. There's a lot of very wonderful women, like, for example, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, Pulitzer Prize winning historian, who would like to see the Relief Society restored to its formal, former glory, where they are managing their own finances and overseeing their own staff, which I think would be nice. But I don't really think that fixes the problem. Um, I think it would be great. But how do they oversee um, decisions that are made on behalf of the entire church? It would be great for the organization to have power to oversee their own programs and their own finances. But I think if you really want women to be fully integrated into the leadership of the church, when you're talking about these councils that we have, where there's a whole bunch of men and maybe a woman or two sitting together, those women need to equally rank the men. Mm -hmm. And so I honestly don't think that that will happen until women are are ordained and they're incorporated into the same hierarchy that men are. I think that men in our church need the experience of reporting to a woman. It's not just that we women need to have the opportunity to report to women, but also men. How will men ever respect women if they are never in their entire church experience called on to listen to a woman ever in terms of I'm accountable to her? Yes, that's getting more and more common in the work world, regular work world. I mean, there's still gender gaps there, of course, too, but that's a common experience, especially for younger Latter-day Saints, right? They, they see um, this definitely. all the time. Yeah. So yeah, six days of the week, we go out there and we're reporting to both women and men. Um, both men and women are reporting to us in our work positions. And then we go to church and all of a sudden we're treated so differently. Hmm. So bringing up one of those um, episodes of gender inequity, women on the stand, that, that decision to force uh, Relief Society presidents off the stand in the Bay Area and several stakes of Northern California, that decision was made by men, mm-hmm. even though for a decade it was perceived as being completely successful. No women were included in that decision. 
Right. And that's the risk that you have when you try to set up a situation in which men are the only ones in the hierarchy and women are important too over here as consultants, outsiders. Um, there's every kind of step that we gain, every improvement that we have is completely at risk that it could be taken away at any moment by our male leaders. Uh, if we really want any progress we made to be safe, be secure, we need representatives of women who have equal power to men who are there and included in that decision-making process. We can't just have our ideas vetoed at any moment by any male person. So short of ordination, are there other things the church could do to, for greater gender equity? Um, definitely. Um, to use an old missionary term, trying to create equity without ordi women's ordination is less effective. Um, I don't know if you read that old white handbook we used to have, um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but there are definitely things we can do. I mean, just looking at the things that we've talked about today. Okay. Instead of saying these are the nine eligible women, we could expand that. You mentioned there's already women in other countries, unfortunately not in the United States, who are working in high level consulting callings. What if they were actually on these councils? What if they were given authority to participate in those? That would be helpful. What if they were invited to speak in general conference? So that we didn't just have to have these nine women taking turns, but we had a, as many women as men taking turns on the stand and having a proportionate representation there. That would definitely help. Um, so, you know, there's definitely steps we can take along the way. I'm going to return to the ordination thing, and you've already brought it up, but, and I want you to expand on this now. It, is ordaining women really the only way to truly balance the scales? Yes. Am I supposed to answer explain, that? Explain. explain <laughs> ex is yes. And explain why, why that is. Okay. So it won't do it on its own. Just to clarify, like if we, if they announced today, surprise, we're ordaining women, I'd be like, yay, yes. And we'd have a big party. It would not fix gender equity in the church because it's just one necessary step. Mm. But without it, you can't get all the way there. So you know, if you look at a, a, a situation like we're talking about where women are in these councils and every person in the room who's male outranks them, we're never going to have equity that way. That said, I mean, if there were more women there and if they were given more authority than they are now, then definitely it would be better than it mm -hmm. is now. So uh, the late scholar Melissa Inouye suggested that without giving women the priesthood, divide up the roles and have men take over the ordinance work. Like if someone wanted to be baptized, they would go to the men while women deal with real life issues like finances, you know, how much money should the young men get for their, you know, outing you'd go to the women. I guess what she's arguing is give even without ordination, give women more meaningful roles in that way, they, they would supervise men. Oh, I love Melissa that that's such an intriguing idea because the purse strings are something that has been something that our male leaders have really held tight to. Mm -hmm. So you can see how important it is. And in the scriptures, it talks about all things are, are not just temporal, but spiritual. And so having financial authority would really make a difference for women, which we don't have. And you've seen that be a sticking point over time where women have had priorities and they've had things that they've been working towards saving money in our church for. And then that money was taken away because they didn't have any power over it. And then those things were put towards other priorities that maybe women wouldn't have chosen. So I can see how a solution like that would really help women to have more power in the church. It's not the solution I would choose because just as there are some men who are really good at finances and some men who are really good at ordinance work. There's likewise some women who are really good at either of those two things. And for every individual who has, you know, a chance to contribute to the church, if we rule them out from one particular role, just based on their gender, we're losing that talent. So it's not what I would choose, but I can see how that would be an intriguing idea. Well, I, I, another A word besides authority, autonomy. Um, for instance, what if the Relief Society, as it used to, um, had control of its own curriculum, um, did its own lessons, did its own manuals or whatever, um, uh, and, and had 
complete control or authority over that or autonomy to do that. Would that help also? It would help. I mean, how could it practically help in, in the church? So right now, whenever a woman speaks on behalf of the church, you don't know if she's sharing her own opinion or if she's sharing the opinion of the male person she's accountable to. Mm -hmm. Um, so it would be great if there was more autonomy for women to actually speak their minds and, and proclaim their own opinions without being accountable to a man who they feel like they have to share what they think. That said, um, when we look at things and we talk about like in the past, that was great. I mean, I know Chiko Okasaki talked about how they used to write their, their own curriculum. She also talked about how they took that authority away from her without even discussing it with her. And it was a big surprise. And so as long as we have the system set up where men have veto power over everything a woman does, even as we give them more autonomy and more authority to do various things, we never know at any moment when that's going to be taken away. Mm -hmm. But but I do think it's important to continue trying in the meantime, as long as women don't hold the priesthood, don't have equal power with men. Every time we can expand their authority, even if it is precarious, because it could be taken away at any moment, it's better at that time that they have it. Um, uh, Peggy talked about this in her intro, uh, but would longer service for the general women's leaders help also? I mean, right now, the general women's leaders, these mm -hmm. nine we're talking yeah. about, are generally in for five years, maybe five years and a few months sometimes, right. depending on how things hand off. Um, would that help also establish, make them more fixtures and established in, in the church? I actually think five years is about the right length of time for a calling of that busyness. Should it be that the same said, for men though, then too? More of an in and out I too? I think lifelong is not a good length of time for a calling. <laughs> I, I, I think it would be wonderful if um, it was more equal in the terms that in it, like we have a merit as 70s, there should be the opportunity to have a merit as apostles. We shouldn't work people to their death, but that's an entirely different conversation. Mm -hmm. That said, um, one thing about that, look at 70s and apostles. When people become apostles in our church, they've already been serving maybe in the presiding bishopric or in the 70s for quite a while. We already know them at the time they receive that calling. That's not true for women because w women's callings are completely invisible until they get to those nine places. Mm. And so even though they may have been working in the church, and I assume they have been because these are very smart women that they call who have been working for the church for a long time. We haven't met them yet. And we only get to know them during those five years and then they vanish. What if there were many more visible callings for women, just like there are seventies and apostles and first presidencies. What if women could rotate through these different callings and maybe they would be relief society present for five years and then they would be a 70 or whatever that equivalent is for another five. You would see them in different capacities and you would get to know them better. What about general authority status of whatever that might be? Um, I, I'm not sure priesthood has to be related to general right. authority status. Absolutely. Right? I mean, I think it's very disappointing that we continue to call people who are serving in these intense callings where they are very um, visible in the world and making statements on behalf of the church. And we don't give them, well, the respect of calling them an authority. Mm -hmm. So it would definitely help if we elevated what we're calling them and we gave them appropriate titles to reflect what they're doing. So put on your, you know, look in your, <laughs> look in the future and tell us what would you do if you were the relief general relief society president under the current system? What would you like to see her do or what would you do? I would love for her to push back. Um, when, the brethren announced maybe something that seems like this initiative might not be good for women. I would love if she would do it at any moment. She doesn't report to any women, but I would love her taking that, you know, her 15 minutes of fame, her short time when she is up there to actually um, speak on behalf of women. And when something comes up where like, for example, recently um, I assume it's the brethren chose Garment wearing is an initiative that they care about right now mm -hmm. and that they're making a big deal. Well, garment wearing is an initiative that has a much bigger effect on women than it does on men. And they've had our female leaders acting as spokespeople on their behalf talking about this issue. And we can't tell whether this is what they sincerely believe or if this is what they are instructed to say because they're accountable to these male leaders. Um, 
So regardless of whether that's whichever way it goes, it would lo- I would love to know that in the back rooms that they are bringing up these issues that women might have with these policies that the men are selecting, that they are talking to them about what makes these issues uniquely different for women than they might be for men or more harder to or harder to deal with or maybe less affirming and less spiritual for them. And that they are on the back doors trying to talk about that. Now, like you said, they're not meeting with them one on one. So that makes it harder. That means that in these councils where they're vastly outnumbered, they're going to have to be even louder than any of those men in the room would have to be. They're going to have to be, you know, making their force known, making their power known and really talking loud. The good thing is, even though women did not select these women who are leaders, I think they're wonderful people. And I think they have a lot of potential. And I think that they really are powerful personalities. And I think that they, even within the system we have that is not set up to serve them and is not set up to make women have a voice, it's almost set up to like quiet women at every moment. I think they have the potential to make themselves heard. And I would love to see them do that. April Young Bennett, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And thanks to talk. And thanks to Dave Noyce. Always a pleasure. And to our producer, Chris Samuels. We remind our listeners that they can keep up on all the happenings in and about the church by subscribing to the Salt Lake Tribune's free Mormonland newsletter. Just go to sltrib.com to sign up and we'll talk again next week.